maps it's centrally to everything i don't get involved necessarily closely with students because you know it's it's important that we remain on the outside of it because that's what your tutors are there for but um the other role that i've got as well within this is that i liaise with the examiner team so everything then that fits together but it's fair that that's the main thing i make sure that things are, are fair and and transparent so is that all right john is that so to sum it up just let someone know who you are and your background that's really helpful um so what i'll do now um i'll now let felicity in Hi, Fliss. Fliss. Good morning. How are you? Oh, well, thank you. How are you? Yeah, good. Thank you very much. Excited to be speaking to you all. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, so our class is here. So this is the Diploma for Funeral Directing Level 4. Um, we're looking forward to hearing from you. Uh, we've also got Angela Allen online as well. Uh, we've got Rosemary and Nikki who are joining us from down south online. They're due to be here in person, but they got called out to take care of somebody this morning. They're online. Okay. Um, and so today, today we're doing Unit 5, Managing Communication with a Funeral Home, um, and we're doing another unit after lunch as well. So I think I've sent this unit to, through to you. Um, so if you're happy, if I can just hand off. Really, I've, I've even made notes, John. Not that I'm an overachiever, but. <laughs> Give the guys a bit of the background about yourself, and then sure. just do you know, your session and your overview on communication, the work that you do, and there's things that touch into that and feed into that unit, please. Yeah, absolutely. So firstly, good morning, everybody. We've got about an hour together this morning. So I'm planning about 45 minutes of content and then there's lots of time for questions. But if you do have a burning question as we go, just um, if you're online, raise your hand. And John, if you can if you can sort of shout out, that would be really appreciated. I think it's this is quite dynamic content that we're sharing and um, it's really important that it lands for you as we go through. So so don't be afraid to to interrupt. Um, I'm going to start by sharing a presentation and then I'm less au fait with teams than I am with all of the others so have I got permission to share John because I'm not seeing at the um at the top list there should be um on mine you, you get the chat people raise and react buttons and next oh. to camera and Mike there's a share there is yeah, thank you. pop on that you're my, you're my new tech guru Angela just so you know if you <laughs> thank you that would be really appreciated <laughs> which I'm not believe me <laughs> I'm just going to browse on my computer I've got it all set up and ready to go here we go that's it's just opening up it's a little bit of a larger file because I've got a couple of images in there which makes it slightly more um entertaining I think I'll let it do its thing. I'm not a huge fan of Teams. It never works for me, but this is obviously going to be the uh, the exception to that, I'm sure. I'll try that one again. It seems to have. Can you see anything? I was a Zoom speaker. <laughs> if you get stuck, um, please, you can always email it to me and I'll do it from mine if you want. If that if it if you really get stuck. Yeah, no, I really appreciate that. It's such a big file. I did think about sending it on to John in advance, but um, it's it's halfway through. It's doing something, but I'll, I will start while it's uploading. Um, I went through again this morning. So John shared with me the the uh, scope of the unit that you guys are working on. And I went through and, and just grounded myself again. There's some really important. Oh, here we go. There's some really important tactical information in there. I'm going to be adding to that and also i'm going to be lasering in on a few of the elements but let me just get this here we go so that's working through let's just get that into a proper view <clears throat> can you guys see this yeah, that's fine that's first yeah okay fab we'll work on that then so some of the core things that jumped out and I will give you an overview of me first, but this is just grounding our time together. Um, the, the, the session and the module that you guys are focusing in on today is all around effectively managing communications. So some of the core things that jumped out that we're really going to be lasering in um, the words you use are crucial to your success, according to the NAFD. Uh, there's a piece in there that I am going to challenge, which is always treat people the way you would expect to be treated yourself. And you'll recognise, I'll, I'll highlight that as we go through. 
And we're talking very much about the theory and process of communication, barriers to effective communication, um, and how important words and phrases are. And we've covered off as well in there, I think, things like building rapport and some of the nonverbal communication. I'm here today as a psycholinguist. So my undergraduate degree was in the psychology of language, and I've spent the last 25 years specialising in influence and persuasion, in neurolinguistic programming, um, in uh, psychology, behavioural psychology, evolutionary psychology, and pretty much every other psychology that you can imagine. So I've got a lot of bits of paper behind me. But everything that I do is focused on the idea that language has the ability to shape our reality, and it also has the ability for us to positively and ethically impact the people around us. So this is not just about writing an email that's empowering. This is not just around having a conversation with someone who may be in an emotionally vulnerable state. I worked with um, consultant anaesthetists at the height of the COVID pandemic because they were the last person that poor souls who were about to be put on the ventilator were seeing. They had no family and friends, they had no support network, they didn't really know what this virus was or how it might impact them, and they didn't know if they were going to wake up from ventilation. And actually, these consultants weren't able to hug them, they weren't able to touch them particularly. They were masked and they just had their eyes, all they had were their words. How could they use language to take someone in the most extreme emotional state and create a level of calm or comfort that nothing but words would give them. And there are parallels with the work that you guys are doing. You're dealing with people who are having their worst day, week, month, who are living through something emotionally which is incredibly challenging for them. And they are not going to be in the best place or their best self. And you have the, the onerous task, the, the, the tough task of holding the space for them. So what I'm gifting you in this next hour is a very high level and very unusual insight into neuroscience and the psychology of language, what is happening to them, how you can proactively and positively and very deliberately take charge of this communication process. So let's dive in. I've touched on this a little already. This is just really the, the work that we're doing. So we're combining four core modalities today. We're looking at psycholinguistics, the applied psychology of language to create an emotional connection. We're looking at behavioural psychology, how we process the words and the communication and how that what that does to us and to our actions thereafter. Influence and persuasion, how we can be the most compelling version of ourselves and have our message land in the way that we intend. And then neurolinguistic programming, how we can understand the science of what's going on in someone's mind and pivot our message so that it lands. All four of these are sister arts and sciences and, and we've woven them all together for the purpose of, of today's content. And I'm going to start with what seems like a very... Um, uh, just almost a throwaway statement, but I hope that this sticks with you over our time together and I'm going to be repeating it to deliberately anchor it for you. And it's the statement that your truth is not the truth. It seems simplistic, but the more you sit with that, the more profound it will be. And it links into the statement that I, I picked up from the NEFD. So always treat people the way you would be expect or you would expect to be treated yourself. And absolutely but also absolutely not. My mum is a very wise woman and she told me to speak to people how I would wish to be spoken to. Now, the rest of the advice she's given me my whole life has been stellar, I have to say, no criticism there, but that was singly the worst piece of advice communication-wise that anyone could have ever given. And it's not her fault because we have all been brought up through the education system, through a societal structure to do just that. Kindness is treating people, speaking to people in the way that we would wish. The best thing that you can do is speak to someone how they would wish to be spoken to. And over our time together this morning, I'm going to really clearly evidence that that can be acres of distance between you and them. And the reason that your truth is not the truth is that our wonderful supercomputer brains are programmed to focus and filter on what is important to us. 
the general science, there is no consensus. Somewhere between several hundred thousand and a few million stimuli every second are uh, processed unconsciously by our brain. These are through all of our senses. And were we to actively engage with each of those stimuli, we our, our brain would implode. It just it simply doesn't have the function to actively and consciously each second process that. So what we do is we run through a filter of generalize, distort and delete. And the reason that's important is that there is a lot going on around you right now that you are completely unaware of. It's the reason that when someone, a friend tells you that they're pregnant, all you see are bumps and buggies and babies. And it's the reason that when you decide you're gonna buy a new car, all you see in front of you at the supermarket park next to you and your neighbor down the road, they have that make or that model or that color. And if you want to test it, just bring awareness to green cars. When was the last time you saw a green car? They're so unusual. There will be one in front of you on your route home today. There will be one parked down your street. There will be one next to you at Sainsbury's tomorrow morning or in the McDonald's drive through. Bring awareness to something that seems unusual to you. Now, the part of your brain that manages that is called your reticular activating system, your RAS. And its job is to say, this is what is important to John right now. This is what John is telling me is important. I will find evidence that John is right. And obviously, John is a very wise man, so he's right lots of the time. However, this some you may have heard it called confirmation bias. You may have heard other references. The brain is unable to process a negative. The brain believes everything you tell it. It can't tell the difference between perception and reality. It also can't tell the difference between something that you want in a positive and something that you're afraid of. If you focus your attention on it, your brain thinks it's important and it will provide you with more and more evidence about that. Why is that important in a communications perspective? Because you get what you expect and you won't get anything else unless you bring awareness to the fact that your perception, while absolutely your perception of a communication, of a conversation, of whatever might be going on, it's the truth, it's your truth. But it's one single facet of a three dimensional diamond that's sitting in the middle of the room. Somebody sitting 90 degrees to your side will be looking at the same diamond and they will have their truth, but they will be looking at a different facet and it is different. But it's a shared truth. So just sit with that for a moment. Your truth is not the truth. Start with any communication, any potential challenge by asking yourself, is this the truth or is this my truth? There's no judgment there. There's no there's no problem. It's just a recognition of perception. And we also need to recognise, and this is touched on as well within the, um, the, 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 the brilliant programme notes, the Unit 5 notes that, that you guys have got. We have a number of biases and filters and preferences that shape our reality. Um, I, I liken it to going through life wearing a pair of stained glass window sunglasses. And each and every tiny facet of that glass will change what we're looking at. And we will be looking at it differently to somebody else, for example, even somebody who comes from the same cultural paradigm as us, it, even somebody who may be the same gender as us. They may have the same educational background as us. They may have grown up within a similar uh, family structure. All of these things are shaping your reality and your expectation. But actually, it's nuanced things as well. Um, there's a lot of research that's proving that your level of hydration and your level of satiation of, of, of um, have you eaten well? Is it nutritionally dense and balanced? Have you had a glass of water is going to impact your truth, your perception of communication, how you speak to somebody, the time of day, how well you slept. So all of your physiological wellness and well-being. And that's really it's it's fabulous because you can positively impact. But it's also a bit terrifying to know that actually all of this is going on for you. And if you want to be really clear and really concise and really land your message, the responsibility is on you to first recognize and clean up what might be going on for you. 
which is where the question and you'll recognize I'm going to keep repeating this because it will anchor at a, a neurological level. You need to recognize is this my truth or is this the truth? <clears throat> We touched on words in in the unit, so I know they talked about some of the um, the, the the kind of jargon, the, the the parlance that's familiar for you guys within the the kind of funeral trade. Things like removal um, and how words like that can be quite triggering for people. But just to add a layer of context around that, we have I, I, personally, I want this luggage. I think it sounds fabulous. Although probably after my very first trip, it will come back battered and and it won't look anything like as pristine. But when it comes to words, we have the denotation of a word, which is the dictionary definition. It's what we all recognise that word to mean. We open up the Oxford English Dictionary and there is a, a chunky little paragraph that's going to be telling us what that word means. But we also recognise that we have a word's connotation. And the connotation of a word is what we as a society or a group recognise that word means. And it usually has a bit more flavour, a bit more uh, sensory uh, descriptive, just a bit more to it. We also have that third category, and that is something called semantic density or semantic packing. And I should apologise because psycholinguistics, none of our words are sexy. They don't. They, we haven't kind of gone through the whole branding process of, of coming up with these really catchy slogans. It's all very science based. But, but semantic density or semantic packing is a recognition that words have a personal resonance for us. And some words can be real trigger words. They can link into an emotional state and they can hijack the person. And you guys need to be <clears throat> more aware of that than most, because the, the, usually the families that you're dealing with are already in an emotionally vulnerable and a heightened emotional state. So just recognise some words we know could be dangerous. Any words that show or link to uh, shame, to uh, judgment, um, words that link to well, words like should. Try and avoid any. <coughs> excuse my voice going. I've been giving presentations all week. I'm just going to slurp a coffee. Try and avoid any words that are really focused um, around a sense of not enoughness that will really trigger the people that are around you. Any sense that they should have done something better or faster or quicker, or that they should be making decisions, for example always make it a possible so talk about could rather than should just as an example <coughs> sorry john i am getting there <coughs> now i wanted to give you one example of we have somewhere between about two and three hundred separate preferences as an individual and each of these so from an NLP perspective if any of you have done neurolinguistic programming you might have heard of meta programs um, but this is an addition to that so psycholinguistics have their own programs and preferences that they recognize ditto influence and persuasion there's somewhere around 200 250 and quite often they're a sliding scale quite often they're they're almost the graphic equalizer so i'll talk through some of them in a bit more detail but this is one just to really land because i really want you guys to feel this as i'm describing these four preferences i would love you to bring awareness to where you think you may be and also to think about someone that's really close to you it could be the colleague you work most closely with it could be your partner um husband wife it could be your best friend but think about someone and where they may be and this this may explain why sometimes there is a miscommunication or a communication challenge when you're when you're chatting with them or, or communicating in any way uh, and this is most perfectly noted um john will know that i have um my my kind of secret passion is to loiter at supermarkets as a behavioral psychologist and to watch people react and interact and um and top trade secret if anyone fancies trying this stick by the cheese aisle or stick by the red wine aisle because you can stand there for 30 minutes and no one will bother you they just think occasionally pick up a camembert put it back down pick a brie you know you're at the merlot put it back down go off to a chianti whatever it might be but people just leave you alone and you can bring conscious awareness to what's going on and watch all of the people around you now this is something called information density preference and it's one of the the core filters that can cause communication challenge so if you're a why person you are very very big picture 
you just want the one liner, the kind of thing that will make the hairs on the back of your neck stand up and then you'd really like to move on with your life. If you're a what person, you need a chunky paragraph as well. So this is what you need to deliver a task in a chunky paragraph. If you're a how person, you need a bit more detail about the nitty gritty of exactly how it's going to be delivered. And you're, if you're a what if person, you need to have um, a risk assessment. You need to have a, a, all of the but what happens if. So I'm going to I'm going to bring that to life. So if I was going to ask John to organise dinner and he was a why person, I would say to him, John, let's get a few of the guys together. We haven't been together for ages. Can you cook something, something that's going to sit in a bowl in the middle? No one's stuck in the kitchen. We're going to have a catch up and it's going to be epic. Now, if John is a why person. I have given him everything he needs to perform a task perfectly. He's resourced. He's excited. He knows what he's doing off he goes. If he's the other three quarters of the population, he's going to be dazed and confused and wondering at what point I'm going to start giving him what he needs. Now think about this when you're briefing your teams and think about this in your personal life as well. So it might be that John's actually a what person. So I need to explain to him the why. The why is we're all getting together. We haven't gotten together for ages. We're going to get together. It's going to be epic if you remember. So if he's a what person, I might need to say to him, let's do pasta. Let's get seven of us together Wednesday night. Let's do pasta. Um, I just want to make sure that we're all free to sit and chat. And, and I'll, I'll give him the, the equivalent of the framework through which the task needs to be delivered. But I'm not going to be. He would see it as talking down to him if I gave him a lot of the detail in between. I've given him pasta. I've given him how many. I've given him the rough detail. He's going to make it work. But if he was a how person, John would need to know, am I going to make a starter? Is there going to be a dessert? Am I serving red wine or white? Am I serving forks and spoons or knives and forks? Because that's going to impact on the kind of pasta that he's going to serve. He needs to know much more of the nitty gritty detail so that he can make his decisions and be really confident that I, he is going to deliver success, whatever that might look and feel like. And if John is a what if person, John is going to want to know what happens if someone comes with a plus one? What happens if they don't show? What happens if the oven breaks? What happens if the bowl isn't big enough? What happens if it rains? And what happens if there is some kind of natural disaster, storm, flood, pestilence, disease? Are we going to have a plague of locusts? Are we having rivers of blood? You know, come on, what, what, what are we going to do? What is our contingency? Now, there is nothing wrong with any of those four preferences. And when you look at organisations like NASA, they deliberately and actively build their teams around them. You need the why people, because without them, we don't have the vision that we're going to be walking on the moon. But if you don't have enough what if people, the bolts aren't tightened properly and the whole thing's going to be pretty catastrophic. So we need this collection of different psychological preferences to create a really high functioning team. But my goodness me, if you are speaking with a family member or if you are speaking with a team member and you are why and they are what if, they're not going to think that you're fun and you're dynamic and you're you're edgy. They're going to think you're disorganized, that you just don't have the detail. They're going to feel psychologically unsafe with you because they're going to assume that you just don't know. Ditto. If you're a what if person and you're speaking to a family member or you're speaking to a team member and you are giving them every minute detail, you are genuinely going to be causing them psychological stress because they are having a tsunami of information and they're going to start feeling they're going to get um, at a hormone level. They're going to get cortisol. They're going to get testosterone. They're going to be having the same level of stress as if they were in the midst of an argument or they were running from a saber toothed tiger. And they're going to get that simply from you speaking with them. This isn't just I need to be mindful of my communication so my message lands. This is I need to recognise the individuality and the humanity of the person I'm speaking with and I need to pivot. Now, we've all developed the ability to speak all four of those density preferences, but there will be one that is your home turf, that is your go to preference. I am a why person and it's very common in um, in I, I, uh, I have a couple of businesses. One of them is a PR agency. So it's very common in PR and marketing um, for that sector to attract people who are very big picture. And I have team members who are what if. And we have to really work quite hard. If I'm briefing them, I can't give them a one liner. 
I have to give them a chunky paragraph, which is really difficult for me. And they have to respond. They write their responses to me and then they have to copy edit them because they know that if it goes beyond an A4 page, I'm going to be sat rocking in the corner. Nobody wants that. Where do you guys think you are? Let's go into the room first. John, you've heard this one before. What do you think you are? I think I'm a Y person. Is that yeah, awesome? thank I think, can you be more than, can you have more than one to my question? For? You've got a home, you've got a home turf. So it might be that you've got a, a secondary that you, it's a, a second language that you can speak reasonably fluently. Um, but usually you've got a home turf. What do you think your second might be? Uh, what? My, yeah, so a why my prime and then what? So I'll come up with ideas with families for funerals, like holding a funeral service at the railway station. But then yeah. I'll back and actually how we're going to do it as well. Was that how? rather than what. But primary is a why, I'd say. Yeah, well, don't forget that the how is your professional expertise. You yeah. need to know how. You need to know that it can be delivered. Um, but the why, if, you're, if your home turf, if your focus is on that real big picture, that's fantastic. But you you will know that you're a why, because if a what if talks to you and says, yes, but what if? Yes, yes, but what if? Yeah, but... By the third what if you find yourself one you you, you fit and I'll, I'll show you later i've deliberately done this from standing so that i can show you some of the physiology so you can start to spot signs of distress um in somebody because they won't know that they're feeling stressed they won't actively and consciously aware of that until you really push them but if a what if just keeps going you genuinely start feeling like you're being assorted it's it's it, oh should we go on the room please yes please a what yeah. if as well, I think. I think I'm a why. A why? Yeah. 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 Primary. Yeah. Nick? I think I'm a what and then a what if. Okay. Interesting. It's unusual, it's unusual to be a what and a what if. So you, you tend to find there's a divide. The why and the what's are big picture and the how's and the what ifs are very, very detailed. So if you need, if someone asks you to do something, and I'll give you an example from Sainsbury's in a bit so you'll recognise it. Hence me referencing the whole cheese and wine aisle. Um, <coughs> if you're a what if, you need to have 10, 12 bits of detail about a task before you can deliver it. If you're a what, you probably need three. Okay. Well, uh, so what? You're a what? What? Okay. So you guys are all quite a big picture. Yeah. Uh, a why and a how. A why and a how. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, yes, I'm a, a why with um, some traits and a what. Okay. Uh, Joe? Uh, I think I'd replicate <clears throat> that, that answer as well. Uh, so a why, why and a I'd like to think I've been come up with my own ideas with a very limited, well, with, with very limited. Yeah. I would say. Uh, Nikki? I would say I'm a wine most of the time. However, on my own, I become a what if. So, okay. for example, most of the time, you know, when we're looking at what we're going to do for the business, I'll sit and come up with all these ideas. And then when I sit on my own at night, I then turn into a massive what if. And now I start making all these preparations that nobody knows about, because that's quite embarrassing, but nobody knows about. So that when I go back with to reinforce the idea the next day, I've already thought of everything that could go wrong, if that makes sense. Yeah, so that says that your natural preference is a what if. It just means that you've learned the why characteristic. So you've learned to be compelling and to be big picture and to paint that wonderful vision for people. But if you need to then have that detail to feel safe in delivering it, then fantastic. I think, I think that was becoming a salesperson in my 20s and going on really good courses. <laughs> Fantastic, yeah. Well, I think I'm definitely a what. What? Okay. Definitely a what, and 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 then I lean to how because okay. um, I I need that I need that the, the vision to to show me the how, but I I, I need more. Yeah, I'm I hate. a what. I'm a what. <laughs> Good. Angela, you get involved. Yeah, well, absolutely. Yeah, I think for me, I'm sort of a why, a how, and a what if. I tend to analyse things. If you well, analyse, you're probably going to be a how or a what if. Okay. Okay. I like to see the big picture, though. I like to understand what you know what the rationale is. Well, don't forget, what ifs have the why, the what, and the how. They just need more on top. 
Right, yeah. okay. So there's a reason that we develop web pages in the way that we do, because we allow people to access the information they need and then to check out. So if you imagine your average web page, you've got your why, you've got your one compelling headline statement. You've then got a chunky paragraph of text that forms your what. You've then got some bullet points, four or five bullet points of detail that informs your how. And then you have click through links which satisfy your what if people. Now, I guarantee you, if I go onto a website, I'm on that page for 30 seconds and I get the gist and I move on because I'm doing 900 things at once. I'm I'm a very, very um, traditional, typical why. One of my team members will read that whole website, will click through every single link and will produce a Gantt chart with timing plans that are linked into each and every facet, which is amazing. And I love it because I don't have to do it. So to, to give you the example from Sainsbury's and, um, and I'm not doing this woman at justice, um, but I'm going to I'm making her slightly caricature, but I just want to land it with you and see if this sits in any familiarity. This was just as we were coming out of the, the, the lockdown. Uh, with COVID and we were finally able to start shopping together. We weren't queuing outside and only a few of us being allowed in. We were still wearing masks. But it was brilliant for me as a psychologist because I could start to see couples again, couples or friendships or whatever, but sh shopping together. And there's me loitering by the cheese aisle at Sainsbury's and other supermarkets are available, but I just find Sainsbury's seems to bring a really nice dynamic of person. And walking down the centre aisle was a woman and um, what I assume is her husband pushing a trolley and she said to him just as she came into earshot can you get the pasta sauce so my ears pricked up because this is a briefing can you get the pasta sauce and then she took the longest breath I thought all oh, this is going to be really good you know when you you're rubbing your hands it's like oh can you get the pasta sauce and she said make sure you get the green one not the blue one the blue one has got far too much oregano I don't know who puts oregano in but it absolutely overpowers it don't go for too big a bottle do you remember we went for too big a bottle when Tony and Sally came over and we had some left and I had to use it because I do not like wasting I don't like wasting pasta sauce we had to use it and then we used it over and and then it didn't work do you remember we used it and it didn't work but don't go for and then she was giving him some more bruise and she said it's down the second aisle it's third down I think third down or fourth down it might be but it's next to the bisto so you need to go and and she carried on. But what was really fascinating is after she said, can you get the pasta sauce? And then started, he started to hold on tighter to the trolley. He started to show, I'm going to move this down a little bit so you can see. He started to show the signs of physiological stress. So what you see is you see shoulders tightening. You see that the whole upper body gets tense. So it could be that someone's holding their arms here. They don't have to have their, their physiology out here. It could be, but they just start to. It's actually a, a physical defensiveness. This is a vulnerable part of us. And we find ourselves, we might have an arm here. We might cross our arms here. We might, you'll see people literally, they're, they're self-soothing. They're starting to hug. They're, they might start to, to stroke themselves because whether they recognise it or not, they're starting to feel stressed. You start to see some tension in the jaw, but if it was just start to kind of grind their teeth, they quite often they'll find themselves just stroking their neck or moving their neck or moving their head to one side or the other. They can start straightening and playing with their clothing. When they really start getting stressed, their eyes start to flutter more. You blink more readily and your eye gaze changes. Rather than looking directly at someone, you go into peripheral vision. And the faster they blink, the more stressed they are. And this guy, his eyes were practically rolling back in his head. And I did feel mean, but I, as I was watching very, very intently, but while trying to pretend I wasn't, the one moment that really did make me, I had to not chuckle out loud, was he came back into the room when she said, she'd obviously finished her briefing and he'd checked out. And she said, go on then. And he came back into the room. Now, he checked out about a line in. And all I saw was this poor guy and he was walking down the aisle, weaving in this kind of circular dance at which she shouted after him, aisle four, and off he went. Now, you know that they're going to have had a row, possibly in the queue, possibly in the car, possibly at home. And you also know that she will have said to him, you never listen to me. And it's going to be his fault, but it isn't because and this goes back to where we very start, very first started. If you are communicating with someone, the entire responsibility for that communication lies with you. You can't impact them.
You can't make them change. You can only take responsibility yourself. If you, if that message needs to land, if it's really important that they hear you or that they read what you're saying in the way that you intend, then it's on you to take responsibility. You start, if you think about what we've, what we've said in the first part of our time together, you start by recognising what's going on for you. No judgment, just recognising. I'm a an ardent feminist. I was I was a woman working in the defence sector for a number of years and I was particularly I was in my 20s, which was very unusual. I was working in Parliament um, uh, and lobbying. I was one of the few women back then who weren't a secretary. So, you know, if I walked into a room ready to brief on, you know, defence, uh, on, on military aircraft I was working on, the amount of times that people would say to me, you know, um, they, they thought I was a secretary and they'd ask for a coffee. So I got quite defensive. So even now I have to recognise that if I'm in a room and it doesn't happen so much, once you hit 40, you start, I don't know, I don't, I don't quite know what happens. They just start taking you a bit more seriously, I think. But even now, if I walk into a room and someone without even meaning to says something patronising, I have to bring awareness to the fact that this is my truth. They don't know what's gone on. And I have to almost self-soothe. That's one of my filters and preferences that I recognise. I want to be on a par you know, parity from a power perspective. Think about what's going on for you. Think about your life experiences. Clean that up. Then start to think about your preferences. So we've touched on the information density. That's one of about 250. So some of the others that you might recognise. Oh, are you OK there, Angela? I wasn't sure if you put your hand up. The cats, yeah. <laughs> I was, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, lovely. I didn't quite see sorry, him. One of, one of the cats has just walked in front of the screen. Sorry. I'm no, just... I just saw it in the corner of my eye. I thought, oh, you put your hand up then. OK. Um, so one, <laughs> some of the other preferences that you guys might recognise, uh, and we touched on it a little bit, but there's global and then there's specific. Now think of this as a as a graphic equaliser. So there's no um, one or the other. This isn't sort of a binary choice. There is a sliding scale of preference. And if you're a global person, you are the biggest, biggest, big picture. Just it's all about the big vision. If you're a detail person, you are absolutely in that detail. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't do both. It means this is your preference. Think about where you might be. Now, some of the others, it might be towards and away from. That's another preference. Towards people want more and bigger and better. They want skyrocketing. They want opportunity. They want action. Away from people want to avoid fear or failure or pain. They want to, you talk to them about um, uh, hurdles to overcome, mistakes to avoid, missteps to, you know, to, to step around same thing different language where might you be do you talk about what needs to happen to make sure that the funeral goes smoothly or do you talk about what needs to happen to mitigate any problems or to prevent it failing or to prevent a problem same situation two perspectives on that the reason we need to do this work on ourselves all of this stuff in here there's some really powerful stuff in here i was really impressed reading it but there's, there's there's deeper. You need to bring more awareness to you first because you're not sitting on a common um, level that you're, you're not sitting level with the people that you're communicating with. You're both beautifully, perfectly unique. And until you recognize where you are, you can't bring sophistication to your communications. You can't nuance. And you can't flex for them and they need you to flex. They are living the worst day, the worst week, the worst month of their life, potentially. And they need you to take command of that whole communication. Let me just try and move on to my next slide. It's not even showing me. Here we go. So this is really, yeah, I had to do the fun stuff before I, I pulled up the, the kind of image of your brain. Um, I don't know how big this is showing you. It's... Fliss, we had the Obama here last week, uh, last month, Fliss, so this is okay. You had what, sorry? the Obama here last month, so this, this is okay. Mm. I'm all right then, thanks. Um, so what I want to show here, and I'm not quite, this is the, the cursor. Can you guys see at the, at the very top of the, the sort of yellow bit, which is your brainstem, at the very top of that, you've got something called your amygdala. Now, there's a lot of research in the last year, actually, there's been, been quite a progression in neuroscience 
the amygdala was always recognized as the uh, fight, flight and freeze part of our brain. Um, some people call it the reptilian brain. Some people call it the ancient brain. The idea is that this sits and we have our neocortex, which is the bit of the brain that we recognize, you know, the gray kind of pink bumpy bit that sits on the outside. But it's your neocortex that has all of the higher functioning. So in there, you've got um, empathy, you've got kindness, you've got rational thought. In your amygdala, you have survival. And some people, when they are faced with very significant stress, will freeze. They won't know what else to do. Um, and, and I'm talking about the amygdala now because I want you to bring awareness that when people are in emotional distress, quite often they are in fight, flight, freeze. People who are really warm and engaging when they're in emotional distress can become aggressive, can become very, very challenging. Um, that's the fight element. The flight element, the people who are just avoiding, they don't want to have the conversation with you. They don't want to make the decisions because as long as they don't decide what casket, then the person that they love hasn't passed. And you have the, the freeze, the, the, just the complete and utter paralysis. And, and incapable and unable to process. Now, there are a variety of ways that we can get people out of their amygdala and back into their neocortex. And one of those is to develop rapport. And we talk a little bit about rapport in this um, in this unit, but I think it's covered elsewhere as well in, in, um, in this particular um, training that you guys are undertaking. We're going to cover off in a mo some other ways that you can actively build rapport with people. But when you're in rapport, you feel psychologically safe. And that's hugely important. And the reason I've pulled this up here as well is just for you to recognise the difference between a person who is in distress and so, or, or, or suffering psychological stress and someone who may be able to move into that higher kind of functioning. So I'm not, I'm not majoring on neuroscience. Um, it's loads of fun. I spent about five years studying it. So um, if anyone wants to geek out, I'm really happy to have a coffee and we can talk about all things the brain. This is how we start to build rapport. So if you think about this sliding scale, we were talking about your, your global and specific and, and all of these different preferences. What I would love you to be able to do is to bring awareness to the other person. So if we imagine our communication is a face to face conversation, because lots of them are for you guys. We're in a face to face conversation and you're bringing all of this emotional intelligence and awareness to where you are and where you sit. I'd love you to bring awareness to where the other person might be. And if we think about rapport, the easiest way to get into rapport is to be like someone. Now, think about a situation. Maybe you've been you're running for a train. The traffic was horrific. You've parked up. You're running for a train. Someone else is running for the train. You both make it. You dive through the doors. You look at each other and you smile because you've got something in common. They may come from a completely different background. You might have a quick chat with them because you've both just had this shared experience. There's something about them that is like you. If you want to deliberately build rapport with perhaps a client, so a, a, you know, a family member, look at their facial expressions and consider how animated they are. Now, I am a particularly animated person and John, who knows my, my husband, knows that he is so not. He made Jack D look like a Blue Peter presenter. He's an ex-submariner. I mean, that's all I can say, really. And there are times I've I've had to ask him to to bring a bit more expression. I I said to him it was his birthday last week, and I said, you know, are you are you having a, a nice time? And he said, yes, it's great. And my response was, could you tell your face because I literally have no clue. And it's really difficult for someone like me who is, I mean, I'm going to be covered in wrinkles by the time I'm sort of in my fifties because I'm gurning practically. My face is just. But I also recognise I can do that now because I'm presenting and I think it's important to bring energy to these things. But equally, I say I work a lot in science and in STEM. And when I'm sat with some people in white lab coats, they don't really like people, let alone people who are Blue Peter presenters. So I have to be authentic to me. I'm not pretending to be anything that I'm not. But I would say I'm probably an eight on the facial expressions and I might try and bring that down to five. That's still a lot for them who's a two, but it's a bit less scary than me at full fledge. 
sorry, my antivirus has just flashed up to let me know that it's it's um, updated, which is reassuring. So think about where you are from a facial expression perspective. And if you are perhaps a two or a three, and the person you're speaking with is very much more, how can you start to meet them? What can you do to be a little bit more? And it's just about bringing conscious awareness. And don't forget, you're not gonna do all of these things straight away. This is like driving a car. The first time I got in a car to, to have my lesson at 17, I was thinking, I've got to change gear. I've got three foot pedals. I have to steer, not run pedestrians over. This is really hard. And then within a week of passing my driving test, I can remember that first scary moment of getting home on autopilot and not consciously registering the journey that I'd just done, let alone registering the gear and the pedals and the not mowing pedestrians down. We're in a position where we become unconsciously competent. And that's what I'm asking you to do. Before today, you may not have known what you didn't know. So you were unconsciously incompetent. Going through this training, you're now consciously incompetent. So you know what you, you know. There are things that you don't know. By the time we leave together today, you will be consciously competent. You will be bringing awareness and deliberation to these aspects. And the, the real the real aim, the real the real desire that I have for you, the wish I have for you is that by continuing to do this consciously, it becomes second nature and you are able to alter and 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 affect how you are showing up without having to actively think about it. So physiology, think about, particularly if you're sat down, think about if someone is leaning forwards or if they're leaning back. Do they, I'm moving this again, do they have a wide and expansive position? Some people will lean back and they might have their sort of arms on the chair or their hands on the table, or are they sitting quite closed? Think about just whether it's this part of them, it might be whether they've got their legs crossed, it might be whether their legs are stretched out in front or they're tucked underneath. What you're not trying to do is to mimic them. So there's a the one thing I would challenge uh, in here. It does talk about mirroring, but mirroring is an NLP term. And what they're referring to is actually um, it, 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 they're talking about hot buttons, but I'll cover that one in a minute. Mirroring is when you match or reflect the opposite of what someone's doing. So they cross their right leg over their left. You cross your left leg over your right so that you're coming together when it's done really well it's really smooth and it's a nice thing to do but i would really urge caution you're not looking at doing what they're doing because it can feel it can feel a bit icky actually it's like a dad dance equivalent you just nobody needs to see that very few people can do it with real sophistication so what i would say to you instead is meet them think where you are where are you on the one to ten scale where are they and how can you move a couple of notches up or down towards them and it may be that you just you bring your physiology in it may be that you lean forward a little it, it may be as simple as that ditto your hands so i'm very expressive with my hands some people aren't i've got i've got clients who they just they have their hands like this and they have them on the table and they don't move them the entire time it can be very confronting if you're having a conversation with me and I'm doing this. My, I'm not wearing my Fitbit today, but it thinks I do 10,000 steps a day and I absolutely don't. I do about 2000 and then I do the equivalent of like some kind of weird. I don't even know what it is. It's great because my fitness levels, I, I keep getting congratulated um, by my PT on my level of activity. and I don't have a heart to tell him. I'm basically toned from kind of the waist up and like really great arms, but the rest of it less so. Think about where you are. Think about where the person that you're communicating with is. And then you've got your voice. We all think that our voice is just, it's like water, right? It's just a thing. It's a utility that we have the ability to use for communication. Actually, it's really powerful. How, spe how speedy are you? How, how fast do you speak? If you're a really quick communicator like me, and you're having a conversation with someone who's very, very slow. Oh, it's really hard. Equally, I know people when I'm in full flow, who look at me like I'm a, an alien. You can see they're doing the equivalent of trying to put their thumbs between the words to work out what I'm saying. So I have to slow down. 
And I can do that in a really authentic way. I can still show enthusiasm. I can still smile. I can still use some hand gestures. I can nod. I can be assertive and confident and positive and dynamic without speaking at 100 miles an hour. You can raise your volume or speak more quietly. Um, I think we all have this perception that if we speak quite loudly, we, we come across as quite confident. And that isn't always the case. It can be brash. It can be confronting. You know yourselves. You're going and sitting in someone else's home quite often at a really tough time. There are times it's not appropriate, even if your natural preference is to speak with with quite a lot of resonance, you you probably want to drop that down. It becomes more respectful to just be a little bit more softly spoken. Um, and that's so that's volume and resonance. You know, resonance is the Brian Blessed element. You know, when someone is talking with real depth and density to their voice, it, it can be great when you're watching Shakespeare on stage, not necessarily in a one to one. But ditto, if you have a really tinny voice and you're not, I'm, I'm hamming all this up with my voice now, but if you have a really tinny voice and you're not really bringing any resonance at all, it's really difficult to kind of understand the gravitas. You need some of that for people to have confidence in you. Final three bits, and I'm going to pause for some questions. So um, active listening. Active listening is actually covered in here, which is great to hear. Some of the ways that you can show someone that you are listening. You have something called a minimal response. So a minimal response is not a word, but it's a sound that you make to show someone that you're listening. It might be mm hmm, uh huh, mm mm. It's the mm, the little noises, the, the almost little hums. Can you hear the? Think about when you use that. Someone's talking because what you can do is you can use it while they're still speaking. You're not interrupting them. You're encouraging them to continue. You might choose to use some phrases. So how interesting. Of course. Absolutely. I, I, I understand. Those are phrases that you can use and none of those say my turn to talk now. This is not a turn taking cue. This is please continue. I'm with you. I'm here. I get it. Because what you'll see is if you don't use those and some of the others that I'm going to share now, people will peter out and they'll start to ask you, are you are you getting is this all making sense or worse? They'll start apologizing because they'll think they're not making sense. They'll say to you, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm just I don't really know what I'm doing. And and then you have to go through the process of soothing them and reassuring them and then get them back to the conversation. If someone does that, I'm really sorry to say it's a sign that you're not you're not protecting them. You're not creating a psychologically safe communication space for them. If you use active listening, that won't happen. If you use active listening, they know that you're with them. They know that they're doing they're doing a good job. That's what they're looking for is that reassurance. Nodding is a really powerful way of active listening. But it can be quite confronting if someone just keeps nodding at you. So one of the things you might consider doing is just pivoting your head. There's something about a head on the side that we find less confronting. So you might nod. You might say, mm -hmm, OK, there's also a hand gesture that you can use. And it was um, uh, it was first brought to the fore by someone called Virginia Satir, who was an American relationship therapist in the 50s. And she highlighted five hand gestures that are known as the Satir hand gestures. And they're powerful because they create an emotional response in the people that you use them with. So we teach them to politicians. One of them is called the computer. And at its fullest saturation, move this down again. It's the one downside about not being in person. At its fullest saturation, it's this. And you'll see people do this all the time. And what it does, if someone does that, your brain will automatically process it as they are giving this some thought. Now, this isn't natural for a lot of people. It feels quite, quite odd for me. So I'm going to take this away. I might put my hand on the desk and what I tend to do, I'll cut my chin. I might put my hand here. So again, if I'm talking to you, I might, I might do this. That feels odd to me, but this feels great because I can still nod. So I'm just using using this little bit here against my chin, thumb here, and I can still nod and I might do this. So again, I'm resting my chin here and a finger. Think about what might work for you. You can move, you can move the hand. You will be doing this in one way, shape or form anyway. It's, it's part of our human nature. 
and part of the social cues that we have been brought up within our cultural paradigm. This works in a Western paradigm, by the way. Um, I know you've touched on in here some of the different cultural fits, but some of what we've been talking about today is less appropriate if you are working um, with very different cultures. So some of the African cultures in particular, um, some of their practices will that they, they don't like uh, eye contact for example. So me saying to you to meet someone's eye and to nod and to be really engaged, that would be very difficult for them. So take this as the majority of the clients that you are going to meet here in, in the West. Um, so you're nodding, you're using the minimal responses. You might, again, you might look to, um, to use your hands to show them that you're listening. What you can also do is you can temple your hands like this. That can also be another version of the computer. So you're just saying to them in every way that you can, I am here and I am listening and I am with you. Hot buttons. So what they refer to in here as mirroring is actually a hot button. And a hot button is when someone gives you a really powerful insight into something that's important to them. They use a word. And if you go all the way back to that slide I had with the three suitcases, semantic density, semantic packing, is your personal thoughts and feelings around a word and, and not all words have them but lots of words do someone is gifting you an insight into a word that matters to them so you're going to repeat it back to them even if it's not a word that you would ordinarily prefer to use so if we put this into a customer service situation imagine that i'm at a restaurant i've had a dreadful meal i've asked to speak to the manager and he comes over and i say i am so disappointed this was a really special meal and it has been dreadful i've given him two top two hot buttons disappointed dreadful now if he repeats back to me i'm so sorry you're angry i'm so sorry that you're angry what is actually going to happen I feel it here. So we all, we all feel emotions in different places. I'm going to start getting really narked because not only have I had a dreadful meal, but now he's not even listening to me. I didn't say that I was angry. I'm not angry, but I'm getting angry now. I think you'll find. I said I was disappointed. If he'd repeated back to me the words that I'd used. So what I train businesses to do is to come back and say, I'm so sorry that you're disappointed and I'm so sorry for your experience. What can I do from here to remedy that? What can I do from here to improve? How can I, you know, and, and you ask someone, how can I best support you? But what I've done is I've repeated that word back. And what happens when I hear the word disappointed back is I sit and I relax and I breathe because I have been heard. There is nothing more frustrating than telling someone, going to the bother of telling someone where you are and them showing you that they don't get it. It causes, if you think about the amygdala, it causes a little bit, a little bit of that testosterone and the cortisol to be flooding through our body, which is our fight, flight, freeze, which is stress. I don't want to feel stressed. I want to have a nice meal and I haven't yet. And I'm gifting you the opportunity to remedy that. So think about that hot button. Think about that one word or it might be a phrase that someone uses. Linking into that, and I haven't really got it in here, but there's just just in terms of the sector that you work in, there is um, a, a, a term within psycholinguistics called artful vagueness that I think would be really powerful for you. And it was coined by Milton Erickson, who is the kind of godfather of neurolinguistic programming. Artful vagueness is when we use a really general term in a way that allows a bit of, it's hard to describe, a bit of vagueness, essentially. So I, it means something to me, it means something to you, and that might be different, but it's okay. So I might say to you, um, I, it's, I, I, I know how important it is that everything goes smoothly. Everything goes smoothly is an artfully vague phrase because I'm not actually saying anything specific. I'm not saying it's really important that um, uh, that there aren't any problems. Does that make sense that everything goes smoothly? I'm going to agree with that. The other person is going to agree with that. And it allows us to have this joint consensus of communication. So just think about where you can bring in that vagueness. And then the words of connection. Words of connection are a really powerful way to show particularly a family member that you are with them. And it can be as simple as together, a word of connection together, we. Um, it can be, so rather than, you know, our you could go in and you could say our team will be doing and you will, and 
you're creating the division. Think about how you can create the connection. So you might say to a family um, or to a family member, you know, we we absolutely understand how important it is that everything goes smoothly and that your loved one's wishes are um, are completely fulfilled. You know, we are here together. We're going to be working with you. We are here to support you however you need. You know, these are all words of connection. They're words that you guys will know anyway, but they're they're soft, they're connected, they're supportive. Any of these things I could talk about for an absolute age, but I'm conscious that we're coming into the last 10 minutes of our time together. So I'd really love to open up for questions. What we've had is just I've touched on a really, really broad topic, but I've wanted to bring just some really powerful insights. So it all sits very much within the, the um, syllabus that you guys have, but it, hopefully it's just landed some of those points a bit more deeply. Can I move over to you, John, just for, for any questions and Certainly, Chris. Thank you so much. That's really, really interesting. And it feeds, well, it adds that depth to the units, which which isn't there in the, in the syllabus, which you could say we don't need to know, but I think it's so exciting to learn because it affects day-to-day -day life and everything we do, how we speak to our partners, <laughs> our families, uh, our work colleagues, bereaved people, like I say, making us more aware. Um, just from a personal point, I actually use that uh, phrase of treat people as you want to be treated. I mean, so I'm just <laughs> by this because I think that. So, and after you've shown me, you've convinced me straight away, I was like, okay, that makes complete sense. It's like we're all different and unique. So, therefore, we need to adapt to what's in front of us. So, and again, that comes down to the individual of the categories you show. So, really interesting. And that just shows it shows your desire to have empathy and it shows emotional intelligence and it shows that you are kind that you're a lovely person that's an amazing thing so it isn't a criticism i think where it becomes problematic is when we assume that other people are like us and actually they're not because it stops us getting if we assume that it stops us getting curious about what's going on for us it stops us getting curious about what's going on for them and it stops us being able to pivot to make our message land what I'll say about the funeral industry, for us to, to achieve the highest results, it's basically, it's, it shows us, it proves that we can, it's not one size fits all. We have to adapt ourselves to each family we serve. Um, and it comes through communication as the, as the sort of source of it, really. So it's fascinating. And everybody on this course, we're here to improve. So it's fantastic. I've got and a but I love the fact that you're committed, just all of you, just as a quick aside, I love the fact that you're so committed to being the very best that you can be because the families that you are going to be serving now and in the future you have the you you will be in their mind for 10 20 years to come if you do your job really well i mean that's a huge responsibility but i love the fact that you're here today and and committed to just being your best well done you um i've got a question for you uh plus it's a real basic yeah. question but it's something i keep it keeps coming at me uh, subconsciously and that is using the word death um, or they have died with a bereaved family. So mm -hmm. and again, in, the, in the newspapers, and Julia Samuel, um, who's a child group UK psychologist as well, she gave me a bollocking because she said to me, you're scared of using the word, aren't you? You're scared of using the word, they've died. I'm like, well, I'm not scared, but I try and protect people um, by saying passed away, or, you know, I wouldn't use the word slipped away, but passed away, I use that phrase. Where do you stand with that? And like for our profession, for our industry, what do you think about that? Are we, are we just shying away from the reality or do we need to confront it? Or is it right to try and protect people? Or again, are we about adapting to what's in front of us? What do you think? You need to bring cure. It's, it's a really good point. And what we're talking about with death or with dying is semantic density. So this is a single word. We know what it means in the dictionary. We know what we as a society think it means, but it means something very different to each person as well. So when it comes to child bereavement, what's really important is that we use death, that we use died, that we use words that are very concrete and unequivocal, because if we use euphemisms, quite often we find that children, particularly under sort of 10, 11, 12, the way that their brain develops, they don't understand that someone has gone forever. So when I explained to my five year old that our black lab had died, I had to explain that his heart had stopped and that meant that he couldn't come back into his body anymore. And he was going to stay as a spirit in with the angels and you know, our personal belief system. And I explained it. 
but you know Alfie Dog was never we weren't ever going to be able to see him again because his heart had stopped so they knew and it was it you know, it probably seems quite confronting but it was important that I grounded that so that my five-year-old didn't ask well why hasn't Alfie come back why doesn't he now that's a dog I get but what I would say is look for again this is an example this is not about what you think it's about what the other person thinks very gently explore whether they're comfortable with the words listen are they describing their loved one or their family member as having died as having passed away what what words do they use and repeat them back it's a hot button word I don't think that we should be afraid of using words like death and died. Equally, I think passed away or passing away is a lovely, artfully vague phrase because people can read into that as much or as little as they want. But it goes back to it's not about us. It's about um, them. My, 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 my point was actually with adults as well, but John's got a question. Well, no, so. I haven't got a question. Oh. I, was, I was going to say to John, so you, you said you feel that you shy away from using death to parents potentially yeah. but that also taps back into how would they want to be because okay. uh, yeah. for instance I'm quite black and white uh, and although we haven't got children you know I would if we had I would still be like well you yeah, died oh, my I don't need, yeah, yeah 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 no no, yeah. no so I mean as like, if, yeah, yeah. I, if I lost a relative or whatever they died so it, it, what I'm trying to say is it taps back into how would so you would probably want to use past to some because that's saying you would want it because I'm not like, well, if you talk into me, but like, well, he's not dead. It's oh. the families, it's brilliant yeah. people. They've lost their, you know, a 60 year old lost their, has lost their parent. Again, I'm saying it now, yeah, yeah. lost their parent. Yeah. I'm even doing it with like 60 year olds who've yeah. lost a parent. So I'm just all the time, is it a protection mechanism for them or yeah. me? I don't, I don't know. Basically. Yeah. yeah. Well, on a yeah. first call, you wouldn't say, where's the person who dies? Well, you would say, where's the person who passed away? That's it. Yeah. Because the approach needs to be soft. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, well, I think in that uh, moment. as soft as you can, and then look for cues from the other person. So, where, where where were they when they passed, or where were they when they passed away? So you can start getting the detail. They might reflect back to you and say they died in bed. Yeah. You then know that's your hot button. Refer to died in future. And actually, if you need to check and measure with any other nuance, then absolutely do. But they've given you what you need. Start with the softest you can because you're least likely to cause offence. If you go in with, you know, where were they when they died and someone finds that very challenging, you're going to get tears and, and and it's going to be too much. And that's difficult to come back from. Okay. Mm. Uh, question? Yeah, um, okay. uh, we, we tend um, to use the phrase, where are they currently resting? Yeah. Okay, um, yeah, great. Because the phone will come through, my dad's died. So rather than replicate the, the or, or to repeat that word, it's 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 where are they now? Where are they resting? And then and then from um, from what they then say to us, we can then, we we would then adapt our language. I think um, from, from one of the one of the the difficulties because I'm a little bit like you. Um, so yeah so so when i'm meeting someone for the first time i'm very like that and it's it's being able to quickly recognize what they're doing and then slow me down not slow me down in terms of what i'm saying but how i'm saying it how my yeah. body is is reacting and it's just like learning to drive a car. The analogy that I gave, you are now consciously competent. You know all of these facets and there will be things that you may that we've spoken about this morning that you may already have known that you may have consciously known or unconsciously known. But what we're doing is we're bringing all of this out into modular elements that you can consider. You can think about your physiology, you can think about your words, you can think about your voice, you can think about all of these bits fit together. It doesn't really matter which you do first. It just matters that you bring aware, bring awareness to what's going on for you, bring awareness to what's going on for them, and just see if you can start to find ways to meet in the middle. The more you do it, the more instinctive and intuitive it will become, and you will find that within seconds of being in the room, you will change your physiology, and then you will slow your voice, and then you might quiet your voice, and then you might choose some different words, and then you might, you might just equally you may enliven it it just becomes a um a second nature i guess i, I think one of the things also you watch her hands it's so funny. sorry <laughs> one, 
I'm going to sit on this. I'm going to do that. Um, is is that that I I feel there is a danger sometimes in that you lose you, and and I think it's very important for the families to see you, and that you. It is as well. Is yeah so so i think that there's two elements there i think stay absolutely to being authentic if we try to be someone that we're not we have a human instinct where we pick up inauthenticity and it creates um a psychological um uh, dis-ease we become wary if someone is just not being genuine even if we're not consciously aware of it there's like a little niggle we're just not comfortable with somebody we're a bit wary so definitely definitely be authentic but equally do they need to see you they haven't come to a show they haven't come to you know, they haven't come to the to the fliss show to come and see me what they've come is to learn something and my job is to provide them all of the information that they need in a way that they can most easily readily happily accept it I want to make this communication process as easy for them as is humanly possible. Yep. And if that means that I bring the 100% saturation of me down to 40%, then so be it. That's that. Yeah, I, 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 I see that. But they haven't just come for information. They've come to meet somebody that they're going to trust to look after someone's very, that's very important. So yep. I think it's that dual thing because you want you want to create you want to create the atmosphere you want to create the situation where they will trust you so then they're going to believe what you're going to be saying and that's that's i think where i mean i do understand what i would say is that sometimes our communication or how we come across can mask who we really are so so who you are your integrity it, it that absolutely needs to remain but actually someone might find all of the hands all they're focusing on is the hands they're not focusing yeah. on you and if we start to, to 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 pull back on some of the bells and the whistles of how we're showing up yeah. we are still us they're still they still want you they want the essence of you they want you to be with them in this difficult time what we're doing is we're making it easier for them to see and feel you yeah i get that thank you thanks Liz. Uh, any further questions at all Angela? for hours to you uh, no i actually just, just an observation that fliss and if it's possible i'd like to touch you outside of today because we're actually looking at from the nfd side um an, an update of the communication chapter in the manual as well but interestingly um when you were talking about mirroring i picked up on that because it was me that put that in from an nlp background so yeah. and, but what i think is really useful is that the breadth of this now and you know the um the different aspects of it that i think we could really learn from um from the from the manual side of so if it's okay outside of today if it's love okay to. for me to get in touch with you i will do yeah no absolutely i love that and and i love the fact i could see that there was a lot of intelligence woven in in terms of nlp and psychology because it was talking about the rapport and it was talking about things that when i first read it i was really surprised and, and i don't mean to do you guys a disservice but it's very unusual that an association of any sector has quite this awareness but then thinking about it you guys do have to be very smart in your comms you do have to bring in all of this emotional intelligence because you are dealing with people who are experiencing their worst day week month you know it's it's an incredible responsibility that you take on and thank goodness you do because we need you all desperately so you know you, you do amazing work and and thank you and first as well the, the industry is also changing so expectation and demands of people are changing therefore we have to adapt and and sort of look to, to improve as well. Uh, John's got a question as well. Yeah, so this is really for both Angela and Fliss. So um, do you think that this workbook, uh, course book, could do with an element of, think about NLP, more around Myers-Briggs or um, Covey's Colours? So as an example, so we've looked at NLP in-house in with Myers-Briggs. So understanding that you might have an introvert in front of you, so if, you're an, if you're an E, how you need to adapt to an I, for instance. So, 
Yes and no. Myers-Briggs isn't really NLP, but from the personal profiling kind of perspective, what I would say, you're not going to be putting every client through a behavioural profile, whether it's DISC, whether it's Myers-Briggs, whether it's 16 personalities, whether it's um, um, Insight, you know, that they're all really powerful and I'm an advocate for them all. I actually work for each of those organisations delivering um, kind of organisational change programmes in, in corporate land. Um, what I would say to you is, of the 200 plus filters and preferences that we touched on, all of those, introvert, extrovert, um, external, internal, um, uh, towards, away from, they're all different filters. Absolutely. The more awareness you can bring to where you are, the more powerful it will be because you're going to clear your stuff. We call it not language hygiene. It's cleaning up your environment. And then you're not going to know where someone is, but you're going to the more co uh, unconsciously competent you become, the more you're going to be able to recognize where someone is and and meet them where they are. You know, this is that sliding scale. You're a two, they're a ten, try and get to a five or vice versa. Um, and and lots of the filters are connected. So you've got your introvert, extrovert, but actually if you build that in with um, some of their communication preference, it's difficult to answer this without getting really in, de in depth again. But yes, do the work on you. Yes, bring all of that to your team. Add in a bit more. Look for it in others. But don't factor in and don't focus in just on the kind of behavioural profiles. Um, I think it's more for, for the people like to understand what they're looking for with a person in front of them. So as an example, one of my ladies commented the other day that a particular person we've been caring for is, um, um, for want of a better words, a pain in the arse was used. I knew straight away what they meant was, ah, so you're an extrovert trying to deal with an introvert, so you're not getting from her what she needs, and this is the reason why. But that, that particular funeral arranger didn't understand that this person was an introvert. So the moment we drilled down and said, well, the reason she's behaving like this is because you're full on and you're doing all the E traits. You need to adopt some I traits, but she didn't even understand what she was looking for in the first place. So our question then, is there a bit more drilling down in these books where, for instance, um, for us guys uh, or people in future doing the course where they're trained a bit more to understand awesome. what they're looking for? Because yeah, yeah. if you don't know what you're looking for, you're just sitting competent again. I'd, I'd be a little bit concerned. So when I train to deliver DISC, I spend two months full time and and I'm a, I'm a I've got three postgrads in behavioral psychology and all the rest of it so I, I get this stuff and I'm still nervous about assigning someone a profile without putting them through so what I would say is if we start including all of that information I think it's enough to say to someone recognize where you are do all the work that you want to do do all of the profile work that you want to do and recognize where you think someone might be but we refer to it as like a curiosity but I wouldn't say you're an introvert and they're an extrovert what I would say is Think about where you are on the one to ten. So how full on are you? Use words that are less um, protected. So, you know, some of the some of the, the descriptives that you're talking about are actual defined characteristics. And unless you're tra you've obviously got some training, that's great. But I'm going to suggest that probably most of your team, they may have gone through it personally, but they're not going to be trained. What we what we're going to run the risk of is throwing a whole heap of information and bear in mind, learning to drive that car is tricky enough suddenly we're going to have funeral directors and their teams trying to navigate 900 different things and trying to assign psychological profiles to the people that they're with. You don't need to know why that person is a three out of 10 in terms of their physical um, gestures, because there's probably going to be 15 different drivers, extrovert, introvert, global, specific, towards... It doesn't matter which of those are at play because you're not doing a psychological profile. You just need to know how you can build rapport. And rapport is there are three out of ten. You're an eight. You need to reduce it down. How can you reduce it down? By doing the work on yourself. So that that's what I would be saying to your team. You know, it's zero to ten on on whatever you're seeing. Where are they? Where are you? How can you find a way to make meet them in the middle? Um, I think it's great having all of that awareness. And it can be a useful shorthand for your team if you've done extensive training in it, but it isn't something that I would recommend the NEFD does. Thank you. Angela, hands up. Yeah, the, the only thing I'd um, suggest as well is, and it's something that I tend to, I mean, rightly or wrongly, um, 
is about, you know, when Fliss was talking earlier on about active listening and picking up on the words that the client and the, you know, the person's using and and latching on to those. I mean, Fliss said about them being hot buttons and I guess that's a really good, you know, to me that's like, yeah, it is. Because then you're demonstrating that you're on their page, you're talking to them in their language. or if, And I think within an arrangement, because we've, we've still got to focus on all those aspects of, of what, uh, you know, the information that we, we need to gather and to, and to pull piece together and yet maintain that uh, confidence that the client has in us so for me it's like the words and just when I talked about mirroring isn't the right term but it was about just making sure that we're connecting through language it, it kind of was it's just that it's also it also means something else as well so it can be a little bit confusing but I think it was I think it's really powerful the insight that you poured in there is really powerful what you're basically saying is bring awareness to the other person bring awareness to yourself and work out how you can meet them and that's it. You know, we can make this more complicated. There are a variety of you can just do that if you can bring awareness to yourself and if you can start being really curious about the other person. And curiosity is the absolute key word. This isn't about judgment. So if you go back to your team member, you know, saying that they're a pain in the ass, that it's about flipping that back and saying actually it, that they're not. You're just really struggling to meet them where they need to be. What needs to happen? I'm going to get really curious right now. What needs to happen for you to actually ground in with that person and and connect in and meet them where they need you to be? What needs to happen or what needs to stop happening? And those that's 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 it. That's the only question that we ever really need to ask of ourselves and our teams. I've got team members and I've got clients that I would put together and I've got others that it's always going to be harder work because they are very full on and the client very very much isn't. So it might be that whoever goes out first recognises that if you've got a bigger team, there are certain people that would go with certain clients. That might make it a bit easier to meet them in the middle. Is this a similar thing of when we say you've got a personality clash with somebody? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's essentially just not each of you recognising that we all see things differently and things like that. Yeah, so a personality clash, I mean, it can come in all sorts of ways, but a personality clash is basically a complete lack of rapport. So a lack of rapport is when you are irritated or you have some kind of negative emotion flare because of your engagement with a person. The problem with that is you will listen significantly less, your message will land significantly um, less well, and quite often you will be triggering all sorts of other associated emotional um, responses. So if I have a lack of rapport with someone, I'm going to start getting irritated. I'm not necessarily going to control that. They're going to be able to read it. It's going to mirror, reflect for them other situations where people have been irritated with them. They're going to get defensive and they're going to get all bullshit. All of this is going to be going on and we're not even going to recognise it. From a, a, a physics perspective, uh, we, we pick up on, um, hun well, we, we already talked about several hundred thousand stimuli every second. If you're sat with someone, a large percentage of those are going to be coming from that person. We're even able to subconsciously, unconsciously pick up heat changes. So if someone starts getting angry, they're going to get slightly warmer. We will pick that up. It's part of our body's innate way, our brain's innate way of predicting risk. Um, anger is unpredictable. It can become a, a frightening thing. So we get all of this response. That's where the personality clash comes in. But actually, if you are a consummate communicator, there shouldn't be such a thing as a personality clash. That doesn't mean that you have to be everybody's friend. It, you can be bounded. You can have arguments. You can do all of those things. And I do. Um, I just ask my husband. Um, but you do it consciously. This is the thing. When we when when you really get communication, you choose. You choose when you're going to be exerting boundaries. I teach how to break rapport just as much as I teach how to build rapport. Because we don't always have to be in a collaborative situation. There are times when we absolutely need to be confronting. But we're talking about people who are in the in the power dynamic usually are because of emotional vulnerability, which means that we need to meet them. We need to be particularly understanding or um, considerate or whatever it might be. Um, but yeah, personality clashes. I haven't I, I haven't brought awareness to me. 
I didn't bring awareness to you and this isn't working because we can't blame them because this is all on us. I can make I can make a a one to one. I can make a conversation work with anybody. It doesn't matter how confronting they are. I can make it work because I take responsibility for that if I choose to. (laughs) (laughs) You can have fun with it, too. Just saying. (laughs) Okay, quarter past 11 now. Final question, anybody? Last question, real good. Okay, first, just a huge thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank it's you. It's really, really interesting thank stuff. Guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, fantastic. So, thank you. Have an amazing day. I'm going to go home and get jeans and t-shirt on because I've got a play date with my five-year-old and one of her school friends now, which is why I'm not with you in person. Oh, good luck. I know. I know. It's great. I'm getting she's into Barbies and all sorts. So I've got no idea what we're doing, but I think we're taking Barbie's dream plane with us. So I think it's going to be a bit of an exotic adventure. (laughs) Fantastic. Thank you. Have an amazing day. On to Angela and the rest of the team as well. So everyone's got your details to get in touch with these. Okay. Yeah, well, thank- really appreciate that. Thank you so much. And John, I will see you and John and I are doing a training together on Tuesday. So literally, this is like, it's like becoming a regular thing, isn't it? Every couple of days, I'll see you now, John. It is. It's good fun. It's good fun. But it's all what we're doing is all based on this. It's about how we improve communication and actually it's within ourselves. Yeah. So it's really exciting stuff. Thanks yeah. so much. Tuesday. Thanks so much. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Wow. Good. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Um, thoughts? Interesting morning yeah, session. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. It's another world, isn't it? Mm-hmm. When you're open to it, it suddenly you start to see it. Then her brain must just never ever stop. Her husband, as I say, we got to go for beers with her husband, and he's just. <laughs> I bet you do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, no, he's... <laughs> <laughs> but he's just like, yeah, she's she's mad, she's mad. But, um, but yeah, she, she's uh, very interesting. Uh, but like from a business point of view, the psychology of one of the businesses mm. that she works with, fascinating. So as I say, if you want her details at all, I'll put it out anyway so you got it. Mm. And that course of start with her as well. They're, I don't see you in the depth of this, but it's only quick sessions they are. They're not accredited. It's just about how to improve as people. Therefore, we can provide better, better service as well. Um, what we'll do now, quick cup of tea, breather, following that, and then we'll crack on with, with the communication units, which we cover. She touched on lots of things there, so we can refer to her, her session as well, but I thought it was perfect what she went through. Um, before we have a quick break, any questions to me at all? All comfortable? Angela, Angela so you're yeah, welcome to join, stay, uh, Angela as well, to join the session as well. Oh, yeah, quick. yeah, that's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if you're happy for me to carry on, John, yeah, but absolutely. No pressure either way, so just do what I need to do. So get the uh, quick <coughs> leg stretch now, and then we'll crack on. Okay, perfect. How long have we got, John? Just five minutes. Okay. You get for it happen. No, whatever. Get the drinks. I haven't got the drinks, John. So the course that you're doing with your team, 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 with yeah, I think it's all you can do, but you just um, 
So these very much uh, uh, into the by comments. So yeah, maybe you're right, maybe you can get it. Which I would have a bit skeptical on. But actually, that that I meant to know is the part of the journey. Yeah, not that part of the journey. Yeah, so it is like the interviews people at high level. Because it's a big structure. Yes, and the one in the library, they all need to be in a problem with the garage and change the So, yeah. Well, some of the things that you mentioned in my four talks earlier, but so. Yeah, a big move, but he's sort of like, is really interesting. Oh, they're building, that's quite a bit of a slide. Yeah, I'm looking at it. I'll send a picture of the flower being made and that's the one 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 that's but now it's hard to put it onto your flowers, not the top. Yeah, so it's not the way. Yeah, it's not the way. It's not yeah. the way. It's not the way. It's not and she does it really There's a lot of family in that. And she does it really well. 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 And she there's big level then as well. Oh, his hair about the client journey as well for him about his touch points. He said, I'm a hairdresser. I'm a hairdresser. Can't stand that. I mean, I mean, Stephen Barber. Stephen Barber. He's a diary of a CEO. Okay. He said, basically, the end of the hair thing was what I mean. He said, it felt rushed. It felt like it wasn't complete. It was like, it seemed like the same sort of time, yeah. but it didn't yeah. seem like the same yeah. sort of care. Yeah. Or the same yeah. 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 This seemed to be quite right. Well, well again, for that drop, what you do, yeah, the head just kind of more. was at the end. I didn't know what it Gets the mirror, yeah. out, goes around his head, as he always does. It's all one second. Oh, no, no, no. It's all one second, the head just asserts. That's all one second. Oh, no, no, no. It's all one second. It's all one second. We're all good, Steve. Then the hairdresser, for every client, what he always does, he always goes back afterwards. It just does like a little. And he felt it's like attention to detail and plus psychology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fascinating yeah. stuff, yeah. really. Nick, Nick does that. Nick, I was just going to say, because I had my head, but yesterday, Nick does that. He does. And, and, and I, I'm not just saying this now because you said that. I did clock. I was like, just I always, the time. Yeah. Have you clock? He yeah. always does that. He does it, and he's always, there's always something that's quite dumb. Yeah, but it's showing that he's got the attention to detail yeah. to the, to the yeah. point. And very interesting. In fact, it's part of that big part of his process. Yeah. Almost. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I find Stephen Butler quite great. Quite great mm -hmm. In what way? I, I think he has this aura about him that he's by far condescending, better than yeah. anybody that's in the room with him. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think he's, yeah, he, obviously he's done well. He's, he's not just speaking, he's done well for himself, but, but it's just the, I'm, the, I'm, the sheer average. Yeah, no, and I think there's an element of that. From a marketing point of view, I'm fascinated. When he said to his PR agency, he was a kid, like he had this massive slide. And again, you can say it's all one extra. Um, he had a big slide in the marketing agency that he built mm. into a ball pit for a marketing agency. No one actually ever used the slide into the ball pit. We said the amount of people, the amount of companies, TV programs, newspapers got in touch with us 
because we were the marketing agency with a slide in our so it is there's an element of what no, and yeah. what actually rosemary said like you said about about what fliss has said all the right way through this is the authentic being authentic so I, I, being, I true, being true to yourself and who you are it's, like, it's a fair point but like I'm the clean market I see what you're saying. Yeah, I don't think it's like I think it's like no, what we sorry we're interrupting you what we have found and what i, I didn't know how to ask the question to her is yeah. a lot of our clients that have come in have said to us they like how they've come